Greetings to everyone from around the world. It's a great pleasure to be asked to participate today in this webinar, and I give thanks to the Arjo Corporation for helping to make this possible. It's a very important uh, discussion today because I've worked very hard to figure out exactly how to present this in the year that the guidelines came out from ASH regarding uh, thrombosis prophylaxis in surgical patients. And there's some important information that you all need to know uh, in order to apply the risk assessment score of, to your patients. Here are my disclosures. Now we use the Caprini score because it's the most comprehensive history and physical available that's been widely tested around the world uh, in surgical patients and in medical patients too, by the way. And it consists of 40 elements. And we know that as the number of risk factors increases, the incidence of venous thromboembolism goes up. We also know that the power of each risk factor is important. Bed rest is a low risk of thrombosis. Esophageal and pancreatic cancer, very high risk. So taking these weights and combining with them with the number of risk assessment factors, we come up with a score, and the score represents a nonlinear increase in clinical VTE rate with increasing score. As the score goes up, as you can see here in general surgery, the venous thromboembolism rate goes up. And you'll notice when you get over eight over here on the right, that there's a very high incidence. So the cut point is, is, uh, is in this area. Now let's go back to CHESS 2012. For the first time, the CHESS consensus guidelines endorsed uh, individual risk assessment scoring and discussed at length the Caprini score. And here you see that they assigned us, they, they, looking at the available literature at the time, which was very small, they decided that a score of over five was associated with a 6% incidence of venous thromboembolism. These guidelines were very well received by the public. They were, were uh, well and followed for many years uh, since that time. Now in 2019, the next guidelines for surgical patients appeared. And these were now been, uh, this process has now been taken over by the American Society of, of Hematology. And in this document, this was much anticipated by us who were interested in the score <coughs> because at this time, <coughs> excuse me, over 150 articles testing the Caprini score and approximately 5 million patients worldwide had been published since the original 2012 guidelines and including one very important, very well done meta-analysis in 2017. Now I'd like to refer verbatim to the Caprini score description as of 2019 in these ASH guidelines. Scoring systems that calculate the risk of postoperative VTE for individual patients, such as the Caprini score, have been developed and validated following some surgical procedures. A widely used high quality guideline is a 2012 guideline of the American College of Chest Physicians, which places a strong emphasis on patient VTE risk scores. In the guideline recommendations for VTE prevention in non-orthopedic surgical patients, patient-oriented VTE calculators such as the Caprini score and Rogers score were adopted. Now that's very interesting so far because first of all, the score has been validated in most surgical, most surgical populations, including orthopedics. It's also been validated in some medical populations. And in addition to that, um, has been widely used. The Rogers score, which is discussed in parallel, has very rarely been used and hasn't been widely adopted around the, the world. Now, this is an important thing. In the references to this guideline, there's one reference for the Caprini score. It's the 2005 article. The other 194 are missing. And these, these data de demonstrate the direct relationship between the score and VTE incidence. And what have we learned from that? The data shows that not all those with a score of five and above are high risk. In some surgical studies, a score of five is associated with a low risk, and this incidence is not further reduced using anticoagulants. What that means is you don't have to use anticoagulants in those patients and spare the, the cost and the complications. 
And the studies have identified a very high risk score for VTE that also varies according to the surgical population. It's not five anymore. And if we take a look in general surgery, we can see the results that I've already shown you. Um, and uh, if you look down here in head and neck surgery, what is the score of five? Uh, 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 very low incidence of DVT, less than 1%. Whereas if you look over here in plastic surgery, a score of, of uh, five, uh, again, is around 1%. But if the score is over eight, it goes to 11% at 60 days. And look, but, uh, coming back to, I'm sorry to go back and forth, but this is important. In head and neck surgery, although the incidence is low down here, if the score goes over a nine and above, it goes to 18% of the patients. So this is critical information for those people taking care of patients in these specialties to know where the set point between high and very high risk is. And uh, this is the pillar of Caprini scoring. It's not rocket science, it's not complicated. Patients with low risk scores don't need any anticoagulation. Patients with standard uh, risk scores that are at risk need standard prophylaxis, which is seven to 10 days. And those people who are in the very high risk group, as you can see some of them here, they need extended prophylaxis. If we take a look at back at the, one of the original studies in the University of Michigan, patients who hit a score of 10, almost all of them had a clot. Now I'd like to talk about what I consider one of the poster child presentations uh, and demonstration projects in the United States. And, and really also good for the rest of the world, but especially in the United States in general surgery and vascular surgery. And that is the Boston scoring system. They decided that they would enforce mandatory standardized and pro, uh, uh, prophylaxis based on the patient risk level. And uh, that would continue the anticoagulation for an appropriate length of time. Mandatory selection of the prophylaxis was required before patient orders can be signed and the length of prophylaxis mandated according to the score. Those people with low scores uh, that were below five really didn't need to do anything. Now, when the study was done, they had to include low molecular weight heparin in their algorithm because that was when the surgical care improvement project was enforced in place. And it said that all patients who underwent surgery should have a dose of low molecular weight heparin or other anticoagulant within 24 hours of their surgery, unless they were high risk of bleeding. We have learned since that time that that, that policy is not, didn't, did not work. And of course it was removed uh, by the, uh, by the uh, authorities uh, because it didn't lower the incidence of DVT at all. But in the Boston study, there was 100% compliance by the doctors of that. Now, if the patients had a score of five to eight, they received a low molecular weight heparin for seven to 10 days. Didn't make any difference if they went home or not. They got seven to 10 days of prophylaxis. And if their score was above nine, or nine and above, above eight, nine and above, they got 30 days of low molecular weight heparin. And as a result of that, their incidence of VTE, which, is, which was very high, was reduced to a 10th of a percent at 30 days, including PE deaths a poster presentation. What if every hospital in the United States did this? What if those rates would be like that? Well, you would say, oh, now, wait a minute, Dr. Caprini. This is, must be some high, high, uh, high neighborhood, uh, wealthy uh, uh, patient population that can afford all of that anticoagulation because you know in the donut hole, sometimes it may cost you a lot of money. No, no, no. This is an indigent hospital and the authorities worked with the drug companies to make sure that all of those that needed anticoagulation got their anticoagulation for the period of time that, that was necessary, including the 30 days. Now let's talk about this meta-analysis. I'll, I'll grant you that in 194 studies published uh, that the ASH guidelines would judge many of those not to be suitable for including inclusion in their very high quality analysis. I, I, I grant them that, but that's not true with the meta-analysis. And also it's not true of the original study that was used by CHESS 2012 from the University of Michigan and the other uh, uh, studies that showed the value of the score. Now, what was shown in this score by Christopher Panucci, a bright young man, a plastic surgeon, 
those patients not receiving prophylaxis, there was a direct score correlation between the score and VTE incidence, especially with seven and above. Take a look at those with a score of 10%, of a score of over eight. 10% of them got a clot if they didn't get prophylaxis. Now, in those patients with a score of six or less, 75% of this population, they did not have a significant VTE risk reduction with chemoprophylaxis. Remember what Chess said in 2012, which wasn't changed in 2019? Five was high risk. Well, five isn't high risk. This meta-analysis shows you you better cast some doubt on that, that conclusion. And the other thing is patients with a score of seven to eight and over eight had a significant DVT, VTE risk reduction when they received chemoprophylaxis. Now let's take a look at a marvelous study that was done in Vietnam from four Hanoi area hospitals over a two year period. They've got this large database and they took a look at 2,795,000 patients and they had, look what they showed. Increasing risk score, increasing clinical VTE events. It's just the same as been reported elsewhere all around the world. And especially when you get up to over eight. So five to six, that's not the highest risk. You can see these escalating risks. This is really important data. All of you need to absorb this data because that's very important going back to your hospitals and for your individual populations. Now, let's go from Vietnam, let's go to China. And here we see a group of patients after lung surgery and those that were low risk had a ver had, didn't have an incidence of thrombosis. But moderate risk patients, five to eight, 12%. But if there were nine and above, it was 40%. Again, the same thing, different country. Now let's go to Moscow. These are very high risk patients. They all had scanning. And if they had a low score of, if they had a score of five to eight, there was only one clot. But if they had a score of over, of 12 to 15, 65% of them had a, had a, a positive duplex scan. Very important data. You see that same escalation, just different country, same escalation. Now. Another very important observation, and, and Cyril Lobostov from, from Moscow is a brilliant young investigator that's made some very important contributions. And you know, these days, especially based on the recent New England Journal article, everybody's talking about, well, maybe we should do away with pneumatic compression, and it costs a lot of money, and the trial at New England showed that it didn't lower the incidence of DVT compared to low molecular weight heparin alone. Well, now, wait a minute. There were a number of things wrong with that trial, which we won't go into here, but we've written an editorial on that. But Lobostov decided to take a look at this. And he noted that in patients with a score of nine or more, the, the frequency of symptomatic VTE events was as high as 11%. And in those with a score of 11 or greater, the incidence of asymptomatic VTE approached 59%, despite the combination of external compression stockings and lower, low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. The authors postulated that this extremely high risk group uh, requires improvements in their protocol. So escalating the dose uh, was one option, but could lead to increased bleeding. But they decided to combine IPC with, with uh, a lower extremity, with low molecular weight heparin. Now in, the, in their 59% that I already talked about, that was with stockings. Now they're talking about putting together stockings, low molecular weight heparin and pneumatic compression. So we saw the stockings didn't really help that much, but with the pneumatic compression, they randomized 407 patients to receive either uh, stockings and low molecular weight heparin called the control group or stockings, pneumatic compression and low molecular weight heparin, which would be the study group. All patients went under, underwent blinded duplex scans preoperatively, 12 hours postoperatively and every three to five days. Low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis was given for at least seven days or more in all patients, and IPC was used for 18 hours daily. What are the results? The scheduled duplex ultrasound revealed the asymptomatic venous thrombosis incidence in the lower limbs was one out of, one out of the 204 patients in the study group using the IPC plus low molecular weight heparin compared to 34 patients, 16% in the control group highly statistically significant. Five of the 203 patients in the control group developed PE and three of them died. No PE were seen in the study group. 
No statistically significant differences were observed regarding skin injury, bleeding incidents, or PE-related uh, mortality or total post-operative mortality. Now, it's very important to understand, what do we see here? This isn't rocket science. What we see is when you risk stratify patients correctly and you pick out those at very high risk of thrombosis, you're very likely going to get different results than if you put everybody in the same group. And of course, we can't, everybody doesn't fit the same shoe. Now let's talk about burn patients. Again, going back to the scores, five to six, 0.7 tenths of 1% incidence of VTE. However, if the score was eight, if the, if the score was eight or above, the incidence went up to almost 9%. Now let's go to otolaryngology, a different study in otolaryngology. And we see that those patients that had a score of, of less than six, nobody got a clot. So what, what, what's with that five and above? Whereas look what happens when they go up and look what happens when they get up over 10. The incidence was up to 30%. So chest 2012 to 2019. These data have not been included in this and that's why I feel so compelled that we have to get this story out. Back to China. We see in patients with a, this, this was a, 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 these were hospitalized Chinese patients now. This is medical and surgical combined. A score of five to six compared to a score of seven to eight. Look what happens when the score goes over nine, a 24% a fold increase in the incidence of thrombosis. And note here, compared to the Padua score, the Caprini score identified 80% of those with a clot compared to 30% for the Padua, Padua score. And uh, the same thing in the control patients. And so it's very interesting here that uh, this, uh, this score is never even, the Caprini score isn't even mentioned, even to be uh, 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 vo voted or discouraged in the medical patients. So here's another study. We always talk about the fact that preoperative duplex scans are not recommended in orthopedic patients as screening as a routine. But take a look at this. These are hip fracture patients. And this uh, is a beautiful study that shows that the incidence of preoperative DVT was 16.3% when they scanned everybody. And they also found that using the Wells and the Caprini score helped to identify those patients, but only uh, uh, sensitivity uh, and the Wells score was only 41% compared to 81% for the Caprini score. So the authors recommended that patients with a Caprini score of equal to or greater than 12 should be screened with preoperative duplex ultrasonography. Very important point, again, illustrating how these set groups have been put out there. And when the patients in these very high race groups, especially in certain populations, they deserve special consideration, maybe screening ahead of time, but also extended prophylaxis. Now let's come back to New York and the United States, a thousand patients having total joint replacements over a 15 month period, all in the department wide protocol. And the department wide protocol dictated that patients were high risk if they had VTE within a prior year, morbid obesity with additional comorbidities, active malignancy, bilateral stage total joint replacement and inherited or acquired thrombophilia. If they didn't have any of those, they were considered to be low risk. The low risk patients were treated with aspirin, but those at high risk received a, a direct oral anticoagulant. Now, after the study was done, they went back and looked at Caprini scores in all of those thousand patients. The Caprini scores had nothing to do with treatment or what was done to the patients, or uh, they were just, this was done after they completed their study. And what did they find in the department? The department classified patients, uh, they had eight clots in this thousand patients. And seven of the eight clots occurred in patients who the department protocol dictated were at low risk. Now, when the Caprini score was done in retrospect, the opposite was seen. All but one of those patients was in the high, was in the high risk group. So the Caprini score could predict in patients who had a score of 10 and above uh, that who, who, who would get thrombosis prophylaxis, who would get a clot, and also who would be candidates for a, 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 a standard anticoagulation. 
So now in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the Caprini score increases in direct proportion to the incidence of clinically relevant VTE events. We've seen that from all over the world. Identifying those at high risk according to the population tested and the original concept that everybody with a score of five plus is high risk is no longer true. Some patients with a score of five or six may be spared anticoagulants and that may be half the patients. And this is why countries, whole countries have picked up on this Caprini score because they can very quickly divide people into the three buckets. Half or more not, not having to give them expensive anticoagulation and hence not having to deal with the complications. And then those people at standard risk and then that small group of people at very high risk that needs extended prophylaxis. And the set point remember is varied. And studies have now have identified a very high risk group that may benefit from extended prophylaxis. Now let's turn our attention for a moment to this nightmarish coronavirus pandemic. And I'd like to point out some things. In, in, uh, in the United States in uh, January 12th, there were 22.9 22 million patients positive with 380,000 deaths. Now, February 11th, one month later, the total number of diagnosed cases in the US jumped by 5 million. The total deaths by almost 100,000 more. And if you look at the worldwide figures, 107 million patients worldwide with 2,300,000 deaths. What a nightmare. And the United States, India, and Brazil have the most infected patients. Now we know that coronavirus may present with mild flu-like symptoms, serious infection, systemic sepsis, organ failure, and death. Pulmonary uh, uh, complications are especially prominent with respiratory failure and death, and this virus has a predilection to attack the lungs. Deep vein thrombosis, painful or swollen legs uh, is possible, which of course can eventually also lead to the post thrombotic syndrome. Pulmonary emboli are seen but also pulmonary thrombosis. For the first time, we're seeing a significant incidence of pulmonary thrombosis, primary clots forming in the lung vessels. And that can lead to respiratory failure and death. Arterial thrombosis can occur anywhere in the body and non-hemorrhagic stroke, paralysis and death, other complications. Remember again, the presence of additional risk factors compounds the likelihood of a poor outcome. We can't forget everything we learned before COVID came down. We have to apply these same risk principles to the COVID patients, but they have another increased level of risk, which is thrombosis. Now we know that the virus causes an inflammation which triggers cytokines, a cytokine storm, causing tissue factor release, thrombin generation, fibrin formation, and so the, the fibrin coats the virus to prevent its spread. What a wonderful mechanism. Well, not so fast. Unfortunately, the side effect is thrombosis with the activation of thrombosis and you get hypercoagulability, high D-dimers, pulmonary thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, stroke, arterial thrombosis can occur. Microthrombosis may occur in lungs, liver, kidney, and brain requiring organ support in many patients. Fibrinolysis uh, is then activated with the elevation of D-dimer and fibrin split products. And that may further complicate the issue because of destruction may cause increased bleeding. And in some patients, depending upon the severity of the disease and the production or consumption of clotting factors, a DIC picture can be seen. Now let's take a, take a look at this gorgeous alveolar endothelial interface in the lungs. And this is the magic of life where blood uh, and oxygen and nutrients go from air to the blood and so forth. And we can see that when there's activation with the virus, there's a number of, of reactions that take place here, which damage this delicate membrane. And in addition to that, and very prominent, the ACE2 receptors, they bind to the spike glycoprotein of the virus, and it's like an arrow piercing the endothelial cells, destroying endothelial cells, damaging them all over the body. And the result of that is this uh, uh, respiratory insufficiency, this ground glass appearance you see on chest x-ray and also associated pulmonary thrombosis. And by the way, you can also have pulmonary hemorrhages because fibrinolysis is activated. Well, let's step back in time for a minute. I wanna talk about going back to, this is a lecture that I heard in 1970, 
from a, a person who became a, a dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Oscar Ratnoff, a famous hematologist. And he presented a lecture talking about contact activation. And the reason for that is that the beginning factor in the clotting cascade, oh, by the way, Oscar Ratnoff with Davies is the one that developed the clotting cascade. In the beginning of the clotting cascade is the activation of factor 12 and then factor 11, eight, nine, 10, and so forth. But uh, it begins with activation of factor 12. And Oscar Ratnoff had a patient who was deficient in factor 12 and his name was John Hageman. And so it's been named the Hageman factor. And this brilliant lecture showed that uh, uh, Oscar presented four experiments done before the turn of the 20th century that showed when contact activation of the blood occurs through factor 12, platelets are activated producing platelet plugs, coagulation with fibrin and thrombosis, fibrinolysis with a destruction of, of those clots and fibrin split products of D-dimer. And also the inflammatory pathways of complement with the IL-1, IL-6 cytokine storm. That's where the cytokine storm is. But also the, the, the kinin system, bradykinins, PF-DIL. Uh, and as a result of that, blood would leak out of the blood vessels due to PF-DIL, vasodilatation, hypotension, bradycardia, and shock. What a nightmare that's going on. And we know that COVID-19 is the tangled hemostatic web on steroids. I know sometimes we use steroids, but that's not what I mean. It, it a greatly enhanced series of reactions. And I'd like to read what Oscar Ratnoff said about this whole series of mechanisms, because I think it's very important today, and it's important for our understanding of the coronavirus disease. The thesis of my talk is not new. We think about clotting, fibrinolysis, immune reactions and inflammation as if they were separate and separable processes. In truth, these distinctions are man-made. In real life, it is the body as a whole that responds to injury. The processes through which it defends itself are interlocked like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We may be intrigued by the intricate pieces of this puzzle, but the picture emerges only when they are put together. So we have to get together with the clotters, the inflammatory doctors, and the immunologists all together to attack this disease. And what this points out <coughs> very, very clearly, anticoagulation is not the answer. So the American Society of, of Hematology just issued guidelines, which first came out in October, uh, on the use of anticoagulation for thrombosis prophylaxis in patients with COVID-19. Now, around the world during this year, Thousands of investigators have been literally tearing their hair out because patients would come in. In the beginning, we didn't give prophylaxis, and we saw all these clots. So then finally, we figured out that everybody needed to get standard thrombosis prophylaxis unless they were high risk of bleeding. But then as we went on, there were patients with D-dimers 10, 20 times normal, and patients on respirators with increased oxygen uh, uh, requirements and, and organ failure and so forth. So naturally clinicians all over the world started to jack up these doses higher and higher. And under most circumstances, those doses did not necessarily change the death rate in most of the patients. Some patients that lowered the DVT rate, and there are sporadic reports of changes in, in death regarding this, but in general, it was a real conglomeration. Nobody really understood what to do. So the American Society of Hematology really tried to put together some guidelines to give us some information about how to proceed. And they, they uh, uh, after evaluating the literature, they decided that as of the current time, that standard intensity anticoagulation, instead of intermediate intensity or therapeutic intensity for inpatient prophylaxis with COVID-19 should be used. They recognized, however, the need for high quality randomized controlled trials comparing different intensities of anticoagulation. They acknowledge that these conditional recommendations may be followed by the majority, but not all individuals. An individual assessment of the patient's risk and thrombosis and bleeding is important when deciding on anticoagulation intensity. That's all well and good, but I would like to add another statement to that, which I think was missing and is very important. We need to take everything we've learned about the treating patients prior to COVID-19 and apply it to the patients with COVID-19 because there's even higher level of, of thrombosis. In any event, a, a very uh, uh, 
uh, good development happened, I think. There are three multi, this is a multi-platform by the NIH of three big prospective trials. This is really big stuff, a huge effort uh, to get this done. And they had an interim analysis. And as a result of the interim analysis, they couldn't make any decisions regarding those patients in ICU. But those patients who weren't in ICU considered moderate state, they compared usual care with therapeutic care. And here you can see the results. And for that reason, the NIH announced on January 22nd that full dose anticoagulation is superior to the usual care prophylactic dose anticoagulation in reducing the need for oxygen support and mortality and moderately ill hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And I would add to that, that if you do Caprini scores on all of these moderate risk patients, you'll very quickly find out who really are the best candidates to increase the anticoagulation and put up with that increased incidence of bleeding. Notice that it only goes from 9 tenths to 1.6%, but in individual cases, the bleeding can be much higher. So another thing I'd like to point out are the dangers of doing surgery in patients during this COVID uh, epid pandemic. Now in this particular study, these are patients that they had infection confirmed preoperatively, uh, and but they had to have surgery. And their mortality at 30 days was almost a half, of a quarter, 23%. Pulmonary complications seen in half of the patients. And mortality in those half of the patients was 38%, accounting for 82% of all the deaths. Males in age 70 were associated with an increased morbidity, including deaths. Ah, Caprini score factors. Now let's turn to post-discharge prophylaxis. We know from the beautiful Riete database that, and this is a database of patient, patients with proven DVT. And in patients with proven DVT, three quarters of them got their clot once they left the hospital and half of them once anticoagulation was stopped. And we have already established that increased Caprini scores should be used in those patients with high, because of this uh, when they have high scores. Now, COVID-19 introduces a whole new level of complexity. So these patients are at least as high risk, maybe more uh, at risk uh, because of this infection. Now let's go back before COVID-19. The FDA has, has had already approved batrixaban and rivaroxaban for both in-hospital and extended thromboprophylaxis in high-risk medically ill patients at low risk of bleeding. This affects more than 25% of all the medically ill patients, and they judged in this analysis that approximately 60% of all VTEs occur after hospital discharge, with 80% occurring in six weeks. Sound familiar? Despite these data, less than 4% of patients are sent home on prophylaxis. Amazing how long it takes to get data out there. The symptomatic VTE rate more than doubles during the first three weeks, and a five-fold increase in fatal VTPE events occurs within 45 days. We have good trials, ADOPT, Magellan, Mariner, Apex, that have shown the value of, uh, of these newer drugs for the prevention of VTE in the medically ill. And in this particular study, they didn't use a Caprini score. They used the PADA, Improve, and Improve D-dimer scores. You know, there's more than one way to get to Rome many roads. And these scores are all valuable scores, and they provided a very important data in these large studies to show the value of individual assessment of the patient. And I would just like to close by pointing out a, the Michelle trial, which is by uh, Eduardo Ramacati, who's a brilliant investigator that's produced so much good literature and understanding of this disease, and he's involved in many, many trials. And this Michelle trial is designed to evaluate a, a evaluation of high risk patients using the improve or the improved D dimer score and give them rivaroxaban and, and uh, compared to control and follow them at 35 and 75 days. So we're gonna be very interested to see in the results of this Michelle trial, which will give us further information. Now in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, remember perform risk assessment thrombosis using your favorite tool. If you're using a, a tool other than a Caprini tool, that's fine. Whatever your hospital is using, make sure you're using a tool. Understand the widespread involvement of the vasculature in COVID-19. Pulmonary thrombosis and alveolar endothelial damage are prominent features of this disease. Arterial or venous thromboembolism can occur anywhere. T 
tailoring the intensity of anticoagulation to the level of patient risk. Avoid one dose fits all. Don't put everybody in the same bucket. Perform ultrasound scanning for specific indications only. You know, if you have a patient who develops respiratory symptoms and has shortness of breath and requires oxygen and even a respirator, and you say, oh, well, <clears throat> well, let's do a duplex scan and see if there's a lung clot and then scan is negative. That doesn't mean they don't have a pulmonary thrombosis. And that's especially true in this disease. So in conclusion, I would like to refer to a, a saying that was given to me by my near, dear friend in, in, uh, in Maine when he listened about my risk score. He said, well, Joe, you know, this is very similar. He said, you never want to kill a friend and never want to treat a stranger. And this uh, expression has gone viral and they made up t-shirts and everything about it. Why? Because if you perform a thorough history and physical, that gives you knowledge about this patient that you just met that's equivalent to a friend. And of course, you'd never hurt a friend and you'd never kill a stranger. I think that this principle is even more important than ever during COVID-19. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention during this lecture. I'd like to have you go to my social media sites for more information. And thank you very much. Everybody stay safe and have a great day.